ask our brother John Halliwell to come and make those thoughts known to us, please. Good evening, everyone. You may be wondering what connection there could possibly be between modern medical science and a book like the Bible, which parts of it are three and a half thousand years ago. And these early parts of the Bible are often thought by critical people to be totally irrelevant to people living in the 21st century. So in this talk, we're going to look at some early parts of the Bible record, mostly in the uh, books of Leviticus and Numbers and so on, part of the Law of Moses, written about three and a half thousand years ago. And we'll find there regulations affecting public and personal hygiene, sanitation, diet, and housing, that have only really been adopted in our so-called civilization in the last couple of centuries. And some of the things which we discover are only a matter of decades old. And so we're going to really establish, we hope, this evening to your satisfaction that the Bible really was indeed a book way ahead of its time. Well, I wonder if you recognize this man. If you do, congratulations. I wouldn't have known who he was if I just saw him in a book. But he is, in fact, Dr. Semmelweis. He was a 19th century obstetrician who was deeply concerned that mothers, often having had a successful delivery of their baby, and the baby was quite healthy, within a few days uh, discovered a, a, a developed a disease called, commonly called childbed fever. And sadly, because in those days they didn't have the antibiotics that we have, the mother would often die uh, a little while later. So, what was very interesting, and Selmweis noticed this, that giving birth in the 19th century was hazardous, especially in hospital. Just the opposite of today. And usually it was safest to have your baby at home. And the strange thing was that the teaching hospitals, where you'd expect the, the most highly qualified obstetricians and gynecologists, actually the the mortality rate was highest there. And in some hospitals, can you imagine, one in four women died of this childbed fever. Just imagine today, four young women going off to the maternity hospital to have their babies, and only three of them coming home. Well, why was it that this problem was worse in the teaching hospitals, where you'd expect in today's world the best results, and um, in, in their world, the best was actually when the midwife came to your home. Now, Semmelweis was different because in the hospital where he practiced, patient mortality was not one in four, but only eight in a thousand. So it was reduced from around 25% to less than 1%. Now, you're about to ask yourself, well, why was that? Well, the answer is simple. Dr. Semmelweis used to wash his hands before delivering babies or examining patients. First, he used just simply soap and water, but later on, he used chemicals that today we would call disinfectants, and his results improved significantly. So, why did this make a difference? Well, the bacteria which cause, causes childbed fever was actually being transmitted by doctors, dirty hands, and in some cases by medical students who perhaps had just been dissecting a body in the anatomy class and hardly wiping their hands and if they did it was probably on a dirty wet cloth went onto the wards to examine patients. And there are actually contemporary pictures of surgeons operating in everyday clothes, not for them the gown, the surgical gown and mask and so on, just their everyday clothes. They might go to the length of taking their jackets off and often they just wore an apron these were hardly ever washed. In fact, surgeons took pride in the amount of blood they had on their aprons. You know, it showed they were really good surgeons. <coughs> it was almost an emblem of their profession. And of course, doctors themselves, perhaps if they'd conducted a post-mortem post examination on a woman who died of childbed fever, with hardly just wiping their hands, again, they went off on their rounds in the wards. So, 
it was quite obvious to Semmelweis that it was something on, on the hands of the doctors, and of course, they, in those days, they weren't really familiar with uh, bacteria as we, we are, but in fact, he, he realized there was some problem there, and so he made sure that each time he examined a patient, he would wash his hands first. Well, of course, the saddest part of the story is that most of his medical companions just didn't believe him. <coughs> they ridiculed him, and he actually and was ostracized, and for, for, for a while, he, he suffered mental illness because of this. He couldn't seem to get through to the doctors. And they were actually killing their patients. Well, nowadays, of course, we take this for granted, and if we visit our doctor and he needs to examine us, he will either wash his hands, or sometimes more frequently now, simply put on latex gloves, which are sterile. And um, in that way, he makes sure that he doesn't give you something you didn't have when uh, you went to his surgery. And when he's finished, he'll either wash his hands or dispose of the gloves, and then he doesn't give what you had to the next patient that he examines. And we take it for granted. But this simple procedure of um, hand washing, of course, has had a great effect on, 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 on the reduction of transmission of disease. But yet today, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in Britain today, there is still concern that people are not being careful. They're not using some of the uh, antiseptic gels that are available as you go into the hospital or into the doctor's surgery. And so um, diseases that, like MRSA are still prevalent, uh, and there are other uh, organisms that are also uh, being spread in this way. So if those uh, who read their Bibles had realized that this uh, may be a great deal of suffering in the past would have been prevented. And of course today in uh, uh, the operating theatre you find that uh, surgeons scrub up for quite some time before they, they go into surgery. They, they, they make sure their skin is, is completely free of bacteria as far as they can. And then of course without touching anything they put on uh, sterile gloves and then they help them with their gowns and so on. And the whole idea is to make sure that nothing is there to infect the wound uh, when uh, a, a surgeon works. And so this simple procedure of uh, hand washing would have saved many, many wives of young men if they understood the law of Moses that was written three and a half thousand years ago. Well, there's a lot of text here, but the important things are quite clear. I, I've highlighted them in gold. If someone has a bodily discharge, some infection, they, they've got some infection, and, and it, it, it may be a wound that's weeping, or it might be that they've got this disease, and there are rules for those who are nursing them. Any bed that the person lies on will be unclean, and anything he sits on will be unclean, and if you touch his bed, you must wash your clothes and bathe in water, and be unclean till the, the end of the day. And of course, for unclean, we might re read not just ceremonial unclean, which was part of the law of Moses, but you might substitute where you read that, potentially infective until evening. And there again, we have towards the end, if you, uh, the man sits on anything, that has to be washed. And all the way through it's bathing and washing clothes, isn't it? The total em em emphasis here is all the way through washing and uh, uh, bathing. And then you move on to verse 7 of this passage, and it goes on again, if man touches anybody, they must wash, and so on. Repeatedly, whatever this person is involved in contact with other people or other objects, there's a potential for the transmission of the disease, and so this constant emphasis on uh, washing and bathing is there. And of course, we, we do much the same. After all, when a surgeon's finished, or if, if a nurse is finished, dealing with a patient who's infected, they will remove their apron, their wash, and so on. They may, in fact, uh, change their clothing in, in order to ensure that this disease is not passed on to other patients. And the final thing is, anyone with a man, uh, that the man with a discharge touches without rinsing his hands in water, must wash his clothes and bathe with, uh, in water and leave him clean to leave. So if the man is infected and he washes his hands properly, he can then touch him. Shake hands, shall we say. But if he doesn't do that, then we have to uh, take precautions, we have to wash our clothes and bathe in water. So 